bike now. <laughs> Why don't we get started, everybody? My name is Peter March. I'm the executive dean. No, not exactly. We've been waiting around for an executive dean, but I think he is stuck in traffic or has gone to some other retirement, so we're going to be uh, today. Um, my name is Brian Scholl. I was a graduate student of Zenon's in the late 1990s. I agreed to MC this event not only um, to help honor Zenon, but because Sue uh, 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 told me that there would be no one in charge of keeping me on time if I was the MC for the event. So I hope you are all getting comfortable. Um, we are here today to honor the careers of four distinguished researchers on the occasions of their retirements. Uh, the first of these is, of course, the cognitive psychologist, uh, Zenon Volition. Uh, in our field, uh, Zenon has asked especially brave and foundational questions about the nature uh, of the mind, uh, focusing especially in some of his most prominent work on the nature of our mental representations, asking especially deep questions about what kinds of representations these are, for example, focusing on the question of whether they are analog or digital. One of the first big splashes that he made in his career was this paper, What the Mind's Eye Tells the Mind's Brain, published in 1973. Um, this became, I think, the opening volley and one of the defining pieces of work, one of the defining controversies of uh, cognitive psychology, uh, looking at the nature of mental imagery. When it came out in 1973, it made a very big splash. It was the second most exciting thing I thought uh, that happened that year, the first being that I learned to walk. Um, um, uh, this occasioned quite a lot of work. There was um, uh, a lot of work that followed this. Zenon summarized some of this in a BBS paper in 2002, uh, and a lot of this was also discussed in his book, Seeing and Visualizing. Um, the second... The second person in this quartet who we are here to celebrate today is a computer scientist who coincidentally <laughs> is also named Zenon Volition. Uh, some of you may not know, given his recent work in psychology and philosophy, that for many years Zenon was also the director of the National Program in Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Uh, and this background in computer science led Zenon to do quite a lot of uh, seminal work along these lines. I think in our field, Zenon is probably the person who did the most to stress the importance in the mind of trying to understand its underlying so-called architecture. And this is by analogy to a computer's architecture, where beyond any particular thing that a computer can do, you can characterize the power and potential of your laptop, for example, by looking at the nature of the underlying primitive operations, the primitive representations, its nature of its memory, how fast it can work, things like this. And Zenon, uh, in quite a lot of work, emphasized the importance to characterize the nature of cognition about asking about the nature of our own minds, uh, cognitive architecture. He did this especially in uh, a seminal book from 1984, Computation and Cognition. In fact, Zenon was so important in our field to understanding the nature of the relationship between computation and cognition that some years later, Another one of our speakers, Lana Trick, uh, co-edited a book, uh, Computation, Cognition, and Pollution, uh, adding the third important concept to that triad. <coughs> Zenon did this not only in the abstract, but focusing on particular types of architectures and particular issues in cognitive architecture. Um, in a series, actually, of papers, uh, in collaboration with Jerry Fodor, he looked at the power of certain types of architectures, especially uh, neural networks, or so-called connectionism, to capture various types of uh, human cognition. Um, many of us, I think, have read these papers and were wowed not only by the intellectual insights, but by the vigor with which they were written. Um, and I will just say, I remember when I first asked Zenon about these papers, and I said, like, how did they let you say such things? Um, he shared with me, he said, oh my gosh, you should have seen the first version, um, which he shared with me, and I, I fell down uh, reading that. Um, the third person who we are here to celebrate today is the philosopher of mind, Zenon Volition. Um, 
I think one of the most foundational, deepest, uh, mysterious issues in the study of the mind is how we come to connect the mind and the world in the first place, how we manage to have thoughts that are about the world, how our thoughts can have intentional content. Zenin has done foundational thinking uh, in philosophy and connected up with psychology about this issue. He's talked about this uh, even in the title of some of his books, for example, Things and Places, How the Mind Connects with the World. And um, uh, this is also a major theme of, I think, his most recent publication, uh, which was a book that came out uh, last year, I believe, uh, with Jerry Coger, Minds Without Meanings. Now, um, as we evaluate the scope of Zenin's career, I think it's important not just to look at what he has done most recently, but to understand some of the themes that have run through this work uh, for his entire career. So let's take a step back now from uh, 2015 and uh, uh, go back a little bit farther. So I think the foundation of Zenin's ideas about how we can ground reference, how our thoughts can make contact with the world, is his so-called visual indexing theory or FINST theory, FINST being an acronym that stands for Fingers of Instantiation. I think we'll hear a bit about these theories later today. Um, and uh, this work continues to be extremely relevant today. As I say, it's a foundation of Zenin's latest work. Um, but here's another paper of Zenin's. Uh, not his first paper, but a paper from a little while earlier, from 1970. Clinical correlates of some syntactic features of patient speech. A paper that I suspect we will not be hearing that much about uh, later today. <laughs> but I want to draw your attention to it. Uh, this particular paper, not because of the impact that it's had on the field, um, but this is actually the first page of that paper, and I know you can't see that, so let me magnify the bottom of that last column. And it says here that something led to the development of a package of computer programs called FindSit. This is remarkable in two ways. First of all, a package of computer programs. That sounds like a boring thing to say today, but this was 1970. There wasn't any computers in 1970. There was no science in 1970. Um, um, but here we have FindSit all the way back in, in 1970. And so um, to characterize the scope of what Zenin has accomplished in 45 years of research, I think we can understand that he has succeeded in getting rid of the D and getting rid of the I. And maybe with another 15 years of work, we'll get rid of one more letter. We'll see where that takes us. Um, by the way, I did uh, uh, bring with me a picture of Zenin actually doing philosophy, which I would like to share with you because it is my single all-time favorite picture of Zenin. I believe it captures his essence uh, in several ways. So here you go. <laughs> Thinkers. It's the perfect thinker pose. Okay, and the final uh, person of this quartet who we are here to celebrate today is the vision scientist, Zenon Blishin. Zenon has made uh, many seminal contributions to the study of vision science, which is my own home field, um, particularly focused on the nature of visual attention and tracking among other topics. Um, so let's just uh, pause here for a little bit. I don't really need to tell you what attention is, uh, not just because you already know, but because the single most famous quote in the history of the study of attention says, at its very beginning, that everyone knows what attention is. <laughs> it is the taking possession of the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. This sounds very sort of vague and exciting and poetic, a little more dryly, we can characterize the nature of visual attention in terms of, I think, a trio of properties. The first being selection. We can focus resources and focus our awareness on some things, some aspects of the incoming input uh, over others. This ability is capacity limited, though. We, did, we are limited in the number of something, the number of objects, the amount of information, the number of features over which this can happen. And the allocation of this selective ability involves some sense of effort. Now again, this sounds very dry a little bit, but Zenin has managed to distill the essence of attention in many ways, I think, down 
um, to his various bones. And that is, of course, in his famous multiple object tracking task. It may be possible that there is no one in this room who has not spent hours doing this, but, but, but let, just in case, let me, let me remind you. Um, so here we, have, here we have a typical incarnation of this task, and there are several identical objects there, and in a moment, to start out with, let's try this. One of them will blink several times, and that will be your target, and you have to keep track of it with your mind. Um, with your mind, because as soon as it starts moving, it's going to look identical to all of the other objects. And so this seems pretty boring. You can keep track of it, but of course you could keep track of it just by following it around with your eyes. You could even just follow it around with your finger. So let's start to make it a little more interesting. Here's exactly the same task. Now try to keep track of two. For whoever it was that just said, oh God, we're not done yet. <laughs> Most of you will find that this isn't so challenging. It, it, it seems to tax some bit of effort more than tracking a single object. Um, uh, but this is certainly in the range of what people can do comfortably. Um, let's continue to make it a little more interesting. Here, try to keep track of three. Still possible, but the room becomes especially quiet now. You start to feel the sense of effort involved. Okay. Most of the experiments that we would run and that Zenith has run using this paradigm is, is done at about this load, keeping track of four. Be careful, we're painting. Yes, sorry. Yeah. We have a fifth object about to enter the scene. Um, please keep track of this object and identify it. Sorry. Um, and of course, you can keep going. You can use this to characterize, actually, the capacity limits of uh, human visual ability. Here we have um, something that will be a little more challenging for most of us. And if you're still doing OK, because so many of you are expert at this, let's try one more example. Try to keep track of half of them. Blink them all. <laughs> okay, and if you listen carefully here, you can hear the results of this experiment. As psychologists, of course, we strive for P less than 0.05. But here, we can strive for P less than, oh, it's so hard. Um, um, so I show this to emphasize something about, I think, Zenin's brilliance in this, uh, in this domain. Um, that task makes every feature of attention simply pop out phenomenologically to you. You can feel that you're attending to some of those disks and not others. You absolutely can feel the capacity limitation. You absolutely can feel the effort. And I think this is where, where Zenin's particular talents lie. Um, um, here's just one more demonstration of this. Uh, if we go back to this quote by William James, we see that he's talking about attending not just to anything in particular, but to objects, among other things. So uh, in an absolutely lovely, compelling set of experiments that he conducted with me, uh, Zenin showed uh, something about the nature of the underlying units over which this ability operates. So try, try this one more time. Notice, how, notice your ability to keep track of four of these uh, boxes as they move around. Same thing that you just tried. Challenging, effortful, but completely doable for most of us. Here is an equivalent task where all, we, all we've done here is we've taken eight objects and instead of drawing them as eight distinct objects, we've connected them up so that there are four lines. And now you simply have to keep track of one end of each of the lines. Objectively, this should be easier. You actually have more information here than you would uh, in the previous display. For example, if you know at the end of the tracking period that that's not one of the targets, you can say, well, that had to be one of the targets since it's one end of each line. Let's see how easy this is. Exactly. Okay. So I think what Zenin has been so good at throughout his career and really well exemplified by this paradigm is first the ability to study the mind, not just by finding tiny little effects uh, that come out in the statistical wash, but by crafting paradigms where we can actually feel the results. We can feel the operation of these underlying processes phenomenologically. And second, I think it's important to, to realize that um, Zenin created this paradigm 
um, to answer certain particular questions, in particular questions about the relationship between the mind and the world and the nature of reference. Um, what most of us do in our careers is we find some phenomenon or paradigm that we are especially interested in, and then we scurry about looking for questions to answer with that paradigm. <laughs> what Zenon has done over and over again is what we should all aspire to. He has done the reverse. He has started with questions, and then he has uh, uh, created entirely new experimental paradigms with which to address those questions. So we are here to honor those four politicians this morning and this afternoon. Uh, we will hear from speakers who focus on several of these different incarnations, from psychology to philosophy to computer science. And I just want to say, um, you know, when I was in college, looking around for graduate school, I, I had been studying a lot of mathematics at the time, and I had been becoming very inspired by the work of the famous uh, French mathematician Nicolas Bourbaki from the 1930s. And uh, Bourbaki had embarked on this incredibly rich and broad and varied research program of trying to really reformulate, in some ways, the foundations of mathematics. And each individual piece of work was so impressive, but it was also just stunning how he managed to accomplish all of these things in so many different areas of mathematics. Um, and this became more expl explicable uh, when I figured out that there was actually never such a person named Nicolas Bourbaki, despite the fact that he had published all of this. It turned out to be a pseudonym, a pseudonym from a research collective composed of about six different mathematicians who were working independently in all of these areas and decided to publish under a single name uh, in order to emphasize the intellectual coherence uh, of the work. And so when I encountered Zenon's work for the first time, I assumed that this must be the same sort of thing going on. Um, in the first place, there was the name, Zenon Politian, that hardly sounded real. If, uh, if, if, that, if like a novelist or a movie producer made up that name for one of their characters, it would be like sent back to rewrites as being too unrealistic. Um, uh, but second, um, it just seemed so improbable that the same actual person could be making um, such seminal contributions in so many different areas uh, of our field. And I was later delighted to learn that this research collective was housed in one head um, and was very happy to work uh, with, with him. Um, so here, of course, Zenon uh, was the, um, the director for many years of the Center for Cognitive Science. Um, and I think given the breadth and interdisciplinariness of his career, there is still no one I can think of, past or present, who is better suited uh, to leading the intellectual operations at such a center. Um, there is no one I can think of who embodies not only uh, in principle, but in, in practice in his work, the promise and the power of combining all of these different areas, all of these different subdisciplines to make progress on studying the mind. Um, we're going to hear a lot about Zenon today. Zenon has way too many honors uh, uh, already in his career to fully review. He's a member of the Royal Society of Canada. He's received the Donald Hebb Award, delivered the Jean Nicot Lectures, and, and received the Jean Nicot Prize. He served as president for many societies, including the Society for Philosophy and Psychology and the Cognitive Science Society. And he has just had an enormous influence uh, on so many areas of our field. I will just give one thin slice of this. Going back to that uh, tracking task that we just did, um, Zenon first inspired the field with this tracking task where he created it out of the blue in a pair of papers published in the late 80s, one empirical paper and one theoretical paper. And since then, uh, that task has captured the imagination of the field and has been adopted um, by researchers across many different labs in their own studies in every single one of these papers here. And these papers. And these. And these. And these. Go on for a while here. Yeah. Um, um, there have now been many hundreds of experiments that have employed this multiple object tracking task to look not only at the issues of attention and reference that inspired Zenon in the first place, but also many other areas and questions in vision science, from the role of eye movements, conscious awareness itself, objecthood, spatial resolution, reference frames, feature binding. Multiple object tracking has been used to explore many, many other. Um, types of processes in cognitive psychology, including memory, enumeration, and most recently ensemble processing. Um, multiple object tracking has been studied in childhood, in the elderly, in children with autism, with Williams syndrome, with amblyopia, 
It's been studied in the context of driving, sports expertise. It's been used as an example of the benefits of physical exercise on cognition and perception. And it has been studied with every methodology uh, known to man, fMRI, EEG, TMS, many other acronyms, pupillometry, cross-cultural studies, the influence of hallucin hallucinogenic drugs on, uh, on attention. Um, I, like a couple people in this room, recently came back from the Vision Sciences Society in Florida. Even here in 2016, there were 18 separate presentations on the nature of multiple object tracking. And the excitement that the, this, this paradigm that Zenon created uh, in this one little narrow slice of his career uh, is getting no less exciting over the time. I will share with you just one poster that I learned about two days ago um, at, uh, at BSS. Uh, as an example of how we continue to learn new things about this. Uh, the title was Multiple Object Tracking Predicts, and frankly, that's pretty boring. There's been like five different papers already showing that it predicts this and that. Um, this was a paper, actually, the senior author for which, a poster rather, the senior author for which was um, my postdoctoral advisor after I left Zenon's lab, Ken Nakayama, done with Jeremy Wilmer. Ken, is, Ken was the chair of the Harvard Psychology Department, and he has just shown that multiple object tracking, more than just about anything else, predicts SAT math scores. <laughs> and it predicts them in a highly specific particular way. This is a study here in this moment in our field where we're focused on sample sizes. He tested 35,000 people in an online task on this. Uh, wow. and. Multiple object tracking, in particular certain types of trials in multiple object, object tracking, were unique in predicting um, SAT math scores, but not verbal uh, SAT scores, for example, suggesting that there's something very surprising and very specific going on with this. Um, I say this just to emphasize that we are still learning surprising, new, exciting things, and I think we will continue to be hearing about this task for some time. So. Um, we're going to be honoring these four Zenon politicians uh, for the rest of the day. And uh, before we get started, let's congratulate him on his coming retirement. I'm going to turn it over now to our first speaker of the day. Who is me? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> and like I said before, I'm in charge of keeping myself to the uh, available time. So uh, I hope that you're all comfortable. So what I thought I would do today to help honor Zenon and talk about how some of our work interacts with the themes from his work is to talk about uh, an aspect of our uh, recent research which is inspired by him in so many different ways, and that is a theme from his work that I conveniently left out of the general introduction there, which is about the relationship between cognition and perception in the first place. So this is going to be a talk about visual perception. Uh, our lab at Yale is called the Perception and Cognition Laboratory precisely because we are most interested, the theme that sort of binds together all of our work, is the exploration of how seeing and thinking connect to each other in several different ways. Most of our work uh, is focused on a theme that I would summarize very simply by saying that vision is smart. That visual perception encap encapsulates, that visual processing itself traffics in concepts that we typically associate with higher level cognition. Things like causality, animacy, intentionality, rationality, and the like. Um, and so we normally uh, go around publishing papers with titles like The Origins of Causal Perception, The Perception of History, Seeing Causal History in Static Shapes, The Psychophysics of Chasing, etc. And when we do this, the name of the game is really identifying, is really showing in a compelling way that these sorts of uh, concepts are really embodied in visual processing itself, really in visual content itself. After all, deciding to treat some object as animate or as causal is not especially interesting or surprising, but discovering that visual processing itself makes such descriptions can be very exciting indeed. As a result, a lot of our efforts are devoted towards demonstrating, uh, using converging measures across a whole range of types of experiments, that these 
uh, ascriptions are really localized to perception. So I've listed here um, a number of the kinds of research activities we typically engage in. We look at phenomenology. We show how these things are dramatically dependent on very subtle details of the images. In fact, details of the images that people are not even conscious of and so cannot be making overt decisions on the basis of. Um, we do some brain imaging lately showing that these things activate canonically visual brain areas. We show how they interact richly and can change the perception of other visual features. And finally, we sometimes show that these sorts of things are unaffected by desires and intentions and the like. And what I'd like to actually do uh, this morning is to focus just on this last point, um, looking at a, a different corner of our research program. So beyond the fact that vision is smart and that it, inc it incorporates all of these interesting high-level features, I also think one of the things that we have learned from Zenin is that vision is vision. That is to say that vision really is distinct, carving nature at its joints from the rest of the mind, in particular from various types of cognition. So this is work looking at the influence on perception of various types of higher-level thought. And I mean this very broadly, looking at things like beliefs, desires, emotions, motivations, uh, and the like. So whereas most of our work is sort of looking at this downward arrow, looking at how perception can provide a foundation for so much of our mental lives, what I'm going to talk about today uh, instead is the upward arrow, the possibility that, um, um, the possibility that uh, cognition in all of its different guises can change how we see and can change what we see. And uh, perception and cognition are kind of jargony terms, so we're going to be talking most generally just about how thinking influences seeing. And I mean both of these terms especially broadly. In the context of seeing, I'm talking about our conscious perception of the world, but also the unconscious visual processing that gives rise to it. And for thinking, I want to encompass everything from desires and emotions to the role of intentions and knowledge, etc. So this question is important. I think this question couldn't be more important. The goal of science is to carve nature at its joints, and there cannot be a better candidate for a joint in the mind than that between perception and cognition. Um, as a result, this question has engaged the interests of our field for many, many decades, going back actually going back an incredibly long time, but in one of its incarnations back to the so-called New Look movement in psychology, where people like Jerome Bruner would uh, report experiments suggesting, for example, that um, coins that were more valuable were seen as actually being larger. Moreover, that poor children would see such coins as being larger uh, than relatively wealthy children. Um, and this gave rise to this, this whole movement in our field, um, uh, around the 1950s, 1960s especially. And um, I think we can summarize this entire era of psychology by saying that the ideas were incredibly inspiring, but that the experiments turned out to be rather less inspiring over time. Um, here's a quote uh, from the death throes of this movement by Matthew Rodelli. After two and one half decades and probably more than a thousand research publications, a verdict seems to have gradually crystallized Methodological inadequacies of the dominant new look research appear to have undermined the voluminous research enterprise. Indeed, in succeeding years, the word artifact became the descriptive term par excellence associated with the new look. Ouch. Ouch, exactly. Um, there then followed a period of several decades of relative peace and calm and truth and tranquility in our field, inspired by notions of modularity of perception in the work of Jerry Fodor, and cognitive impenetrability, um, using the term that Zenin coined to talk about the relative encapsulation of visual processing. Um, this work was summarized in an incredibly influential, influential for me and definitely influential for the field, another BBS paper uh, that Zenin published in 1999 asking, is vision continuous with cognition? Sadly, the pendulum has swung yet again in recent decades. And we are told today that um, this sort of viewpoint is sadly mistaken. Um, here are just a selection of recent quotes from the literature. Um, it, the perceptual systems have traditionally been described as encapsulated systems that are unaffected by top-down processes like affect, but a growing body of work shows that this isn't true. It is a generally accepted concept that people tend to see what they want to see. Um, 
here's, let me skip ahead, here's just another simple quote. This is how this, this question is discussed these days in social psychology, where people write quite blithely that people's current goals and needs, feelings, action possibilities, stereotypes, and cultural knowledge all <coughs> systematically affect their supposedly basic perception. Um, this view, which is absolutely the dominant view in several parts of our field today, were inspired not by any theoretical arguments, but by an absolute tsunami of research findings. We have learned all in very recent years, after the publication of Zenon's article, and in many cases quite recently, that, for example, holding a wide pole will make doorways look narrower, thinking immoral thoughts will make surfaces look dimmer, categorizing faces as African American will make them look darker, words related to morality are easier, faster to see, Wanting something like chocolate actually makes it look closer to you. Thinking about the elderly makes distances look longer. Being good at golf makes golf holes look larger. <laughs> Being hungry makes food words easier to see. And I have to say, I chose these, but I could equally well have chosen a completely distinct list. There's no end to these. Oh, look. Here's some more. <laughs> Social rejection makes smiles easier to see. Being angry makes surfaces look redder. Wearing a heavy backpack makes hills look steeper. Political partisanship changes skin tone brightness. Being awesome at parkour makes walls seem shorter. Sad music makes obstacles look bigger. I like this one. This is one of my favorites. Being thirsty makes surfaces seem more transparent. <laughs> Um, being on a diet makes muffins look larger, and inevitably thinking about sex makes breasts, makes breasts look larger. Um, <laughs> there are many, many hundreds. <laughs> there are yes, th there are many, many hundreds of these effects, all many of them within the last five years or so. Um, and uh, following Zenon's inspiration, our thesis is that um, none of that stuff <laughs> is true. In particular, that there's nothing in this gargantuan recent literature um, that provides any compelling evidence against what Zenon originally argued for, which was the cognitive impenetrability of aspects of visual perception. And this is important. The reason for this, I think, the reasons are multiple, but they are few. It's not the case that we have hundreds of studies, each of which is compromised by its own special uh, infelicity, Rather, I think there is a very small library of pitfalls, uh, probably only about six of them, that collectively, I believe, compromise this entire recent literature. So we can ask, what would it take? What would it take to convincingly show that higher level thought changes the nature of perception? Well, there are some things that I think would be incredibly important, but that would not be especially interesting to talk about. Um, we would need these effects to be replicable, of course. I will just quickly skip over that. Um, we would need to eliminate task Um There's been a lot of good work on this. My favorite is uh, a research project started by a researcher at Swarthmore, Frank Durgan, um, who showed that, for example, uh, looking at the effect of wearing a heavy backpack making a hill look steeper, uh, he showed that that only works in those subjects who guessed what the experiment was about. And, you know, it sounds like such an amazing, incredibly intuitive result, but put yourself in the shoes of the subject. Um, here, put on this really heavy backpack. Hey, how, hill, how steep does that hill look? It's almost impossible not to figure out what's going on. Um, he, he did something very ingenious, which is he provided a compelling alternate explanation for the, uh, for the backpack. He said it was filled with physiological monitoring equipment. It had lots of like wires coming out of it attached to various parts of you. And when you do that, um, the entire effect completely disappears, suggesting that it was due to task Um You'd need to rule out various types of response biases, etc. All of these are incredibly important, but I think they're quite obvious. Um, you'd also need, by the way, to distinguish effects of perception itself from effects on the uh, input to perception. As I believe Zenon was the first to note, um, he had a great demonstration of how intention, conscious intention, can change perception, in particular face processing. <coughs> so I will try to see if I can do this right now. I will look at Susan's face, and I'm going to completely change through dint of mere intention what your face looks like to me. Are you ready? Completely <laughs> <laughs> different. OK, so the point there, you all laugh. You all laugh because that clearly should not count as being theoretically interesting in any way. That does not change how perception works. That just changes the input to perception. Similarly, by changing, in many cases, the role of uh, how we attend to a scene. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about attention either. Attention, unlike these other things, I think is actually quite interesting, but it has been discussed for uh, many decades. And I'd like to focus on some new um, potential um, pitfalls with this research and recommendations for the future. Uh, a less confirmatory research strategy, cool demos, and the importance of distinguishing perception from them. So we're going to be talking about the relationship of seeing and thinking. And um, here's where some of our work, I think, differs from Zenon's a little bit. I have become very pessimistic uh, about the role of theoretical arguments in doing anything to help resolve this debate. Um, these arguments have been made on both sides for many, many decades. I would like to show not only that these potentially independent factors can explain these experiments in principle, I would like to show that they do explain these factors in practice. Um, I want to show that these kinds of things I'm going to talk about actually matter and demonstrate how they can be turned into empirical questions. And I really think this is important. Let's go all the way back to Bruner. This is from his paper in the 1950s, Value and Need is Organizing Factors in Perception. And even here, he talked about how people would uh, tend to uh, dismiss his work by saying, oh, that's not perception, that's uh, attention, that's just response bias, etc." He wrote, like the vengeful and unannounced stepbrother from Australia in the poorer murder mysteries, <laughs> these things turn up at the crucial juncture to do the dirty work. Though such constructs are useful, perception itself must remain the primary focus. And he was talking here about things like attention and apperception and some German stuff. Um, so I want to suggest that these are not just cheap in principle possibilities, but that these are empirical things. We can actually empirically determine in practice whether these sorts of factors uh, can explain these putative top-down effects of, uh, uh, of cognition and perception. So I'm going to run through three quick examples. Um, I'm going to ask, for example, whether holding a wide pole does indeed make doorways look narrower, whether thinking bad thoughts makes surfaces look dimmer, whether categorizing faces as African American makes them look darker, and whether moral words pop out in visual awareness. And I just have to say, um, before I launch into a couple of these studies, this makes me vaguely uncomfortable. Um, in our work, in our lab, for 90 plus percent of our work, we try quite explicitly never to be critical and never to be negative. Um, we try just to come up with interesting new discoveries about the nature of the mind and not just criticize other people's ideas and other people's work. Whenever I'm tempted to criticize some other experiment, I remember this XKCD cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> you could easily, there's no end of people saying things that are wrong on the internet or in scientific papers for that matter, and you could spend your whole career trying to knock these things down. Um, our answer to those questions in green there is going to be no, 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 and no. And there's no way that I can see to make these points without being critical of some other research project. So I just want to be defensive for a second before I launch into this. Um, the reasons for being critical in this particular context, it seems to me, are first of all, that the kinds of strategies that I'm going to talk about are new, they haven't been talked about in the literature before. They're relatively widely applicable. We are not interested in theoretical points that would affect just one or two or even a handful of papers. I think each of the things I'm going to tell you about potentially affects dozens uh, of separate papers in the field. Um, none of this relies on null effects. We're going to only look at cases where the effects in question are very solid and are very replicable. And I really think, as we started out in talking about carving the mind at its joints, that this question matters so much. And the orthodoxy in our field has shifted. Um, so that's me being defensive. Now let me turn to some of the work. Um, much of this is joint work uh, with a fantastic graduate student in my laboratory, uh, Chaz Firestone. That's, this one is Chaz, not that one. That one is my daughter, who will be here at the dinner uh, later tonight. Um, Rochelle, would you like to say that louder, Rochelle? Sure. You just said she's cute. I wondered if you wanted to say that louder. <laughs> <laughs> and you were talking about Chaz, or you were talking about... <laughs> okay. um, I'm happy to announce that Chaz um, will be in our lab for one more year, but he has just uh, received uh, a job. He will become an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University uh, in uh, the fall of 2017. So let's jump into this. Um, we're going to start out by asking, as some case studies of this kind of work, whether holding a wide pole makes doorways look narrower and whether thinking bad thoughts 
make surfaces look thinner. So in general, if you're going to go about empirically investigating almost any effect, I think there are two ways you could go about doing it. One is you could look for evidence supporting uh, uh, when your theory predicts that some effect should exist. And the second strategy is that you could show that you fail to find that effect when your theory demands that that effect not occur. And the essence of this first part uh, of this research program is pointing out that essentially the field has been completely ignoring number two. Um, this work actually has its origin in a kind of funny uh, corner of academia, um, in art history of all things. Um, this is a self-portrait of the famous Spanish Renaissance painter El Greco. And El Greco's work is, has been lauded for many reasons. Um, it's very distinctive in a couple of ways. And one way that uh, many people have often noted is that his paintings tend to be very sort of long and drawn out. You can see that in his self-portrait. Here are two of uh, El Greco's uh, famous works, Mary Magdalene in Penitence on the left and St. John the Baptist on the right. And I mean, if you look at like her neck there, it's just like extremely abnormally elongated. This guy looks like he's about 11 feet tall. Um, and this is the kind of thing that art historians go completely gaga over, trying to figure out why, what was the reason that El Greco uh, tended to paint this way. And um, an exciting answer <coughs> emerged in the field and was taken very seriously for uh, some number of years. And that was uh, the possibility that El Greco suffered from severe astigmatism. Yeah. Um, uh, that a part of his eye was, rather than being spherical, was slightly ellipsoidal, and that this would have vertically smeared the retinal image onto, his, um, onto the retina, so that he actually experienced the world as being drawn out like this. And entire pamphlets and books were published on the astigmatism of El Greco and how this explained um, the nature of his art. And this captured uh, the field for many years until someone finally pointed out that this makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> not only that it's false, but it could not possibly be true. You just got to step back and you got to think about it for a second. If El Greco experienced the world as being vertically smeared when he looked out at it, he would also experience his own paintings as being vertically smeared. Mm -hmm. And so to draw what he saw, the two effects would and would have to cancel out so that you wouldn't see any such effect. So everyone, this is important, everyone sees the logic of this. It's wonderful because it's so, it's one of these things that's in, incredibly counterintuitive until you, until you get it and then it becomes extremely obvious. So um, this has come to be known in perception circles as the El Greco fallacy and we're going to try to exploit it for the first time in this literature. So here's the first example. And, um, and again, I don't really care that much about the particular particularities of these examples. In fact, what I'm going to try to do is to show how this operates across very, very disparate classes of putative top-down effects. The first of these is the effect of action abilities on basically spatial perception, on your perception of the width of the aperture. Um, so there was this paper, one of many like it, uh, that was published in the journal Perception a couple of years ago, Big People, Little World, The Body Influences Perception. And what these researchers did is they had subjects here stand and look at an aperture, just the distance between two poles. And after they had looked at it and they had to imagine walking through it and this sort of thing, they would then turn to the left where there was an experimenter holding a tape measure and they would um, have the researcher make the tape measure a little longer or a little narrower to match the perceived size of basically the doorway, the, the openings. Does everyone get the logic of that? Um, and they did this in a couple different conditions, in particular one where you were just standing there and in another case where you were holding a wide pole. And I trust everyone gets the idea that motivated this experiment. I think it is captured well in this random <laughs> that I saw online. <laughs> so that's basically the idea behind this experiment. So we set out, first of all, to replicate this, and sure enough, it works quite well. Uh, we had 35 trials, we had seven different aperture widths, we told people to imagine walking through it without turning your shoulders, trying to match the methods of this other research group. <coughs> and then they had to turn 90 degrees, uh, here's Chaz sitting there with a tape measure, and sure enough, um, when they're holding the pole here in red, they estimate that the width of that doorway is narrower um, than when they are not holding the pole. Amazing. 
to study the nature of this effect, though, we decided that rather than, we, we don't think this is false. We think this is a very real effect, but we don't think it has anything to do with, uh, with perception. And to try to show this, we tried to capitalize on the El Greco fallacy. So we replicated the experiment exactly this way, except, except by having uh, the experimenter holding a tape measure. The experimenter simply had a second aperture. And the nature of the apertures was counterbalanced. They had to do all the same imagine sort of walking through it sorts of things. Do you guys understand the logic of this experiment? Mm -hmm. if, if the effect here is that holding the pole makes apertures look narrower, then when you measure the effect with another aperture that you're also imagining walking through, the effect has to go away. The theory demands that the effect should go away. Um, the effect should cancel out, just as in uh, the art history case. Um, however, the effect did not cancel out. We got exactly the same pattern of results, not only when the theory predicted it should happen, but when the theory demanded that the effect be absent. Um, and so we conclude that this is not a counterexample to cognitive impenetrability. This is not a case, not an influence uh, of this on perception. If it were, the effect would have to go away. And I want to emphasize that I think one of the strengths of this is that we can conclude this without having to know what the actual culprit is. Nevertheless, I will tell you here what the actual culprit is. Um, inspired by this experiment of Frank Durgan's that I talked to you, talked to you about, um, we simply tried to show that this was a matter of task demands by giving people an alternate explanation for why they would be holding the pole. Again, put yourself in the minds of the subjects. Here, hold this really wide pole. How wide does this doorway look? It's almost impossible not to figure out what that experiment is about. Um, so we took some inspiration here. Did anyone see this documentary uh, a few years back, Man on Wire, about this guy who would, this tightrope walker? Um, so uh, that seems like a good reason for holding a pole. So um, we brought people into the lab, and we replicated the experiment. But we made a big production. We had many different poles of different lengths. We told the subjects that this was about the role of judging distances while uh, under different uh, situations of being balanced or imbalanced, which could be manipulated by holding a pole. We sort of subsequently thought, hey, that could be an interesting experiment. <laughs> um, but it wasn't the experiment we were running. But it was exactly the same experiment, except for giving them this idea. Um, and when you give them this alternate explanation, suddenly uh, the effect goes completely away. So we conclude that this is just an example of response bias, although I want to emphasize again, we didn't need to do this last experiment in order to conclude that this was not a counterexample. Now again, I want to emphasize um, that this strategy is very general. And so to try to convince you of this, um, I will turn next to a case that is uh, the one that we could think of that was maximally different. So rather than looking at action capabilities, we're now going to look at morality. And rather than looking at spatial distance perception, we're going to look at just the perception of how bright something is. Um, so our target is this paper. Is it light or dark? We're calling moral behavior changes perception of brightness. And the idea is, as is always the case here, extremely intuitive. Subjects have to uh, recall an event in their life and do write about it a little bit when they engaged in an unethical action or in an ethical action, in an especially ethical action. And subsequently, uh, just give a numerical rating for how bright a, um, a patch on the computer screen was. Um, or even in some cases, how bright was the room that they were in when they were making that judgment. Um, and sure enough, uh, you get this effect, where recalling a good deed versus a bad deed will change people's judgments of how bright the surrounding room is. We had people recall and describe a good or bad deed. Then there was um, an interim period where they had to do some math problems to keep them occupied. And then we simply asked people online, how bright is the room that you're in right now on a scale of 1 to 7? And we got a small effect, but it was an effect um, nonetheless where they rated the room as being brighter when they had just recalled an ethical action, an effect of morality on visual perception. Exactly that. Exactly. Um, again, our goal was not to show that this doesn't happen. I absolutely think this happens, but I don't think it happens for any, any reason having to do with perception. And to try to show this, we can just make use of the El Greco fallacy again. So we then replicated the experiment exactly the same, except for the last step. Instead of giving them numerical ratings, 
we had them make the judgments on the basis of actual color patches of lightness. You get the idea? Mm -hmm. If the effect is really a perceptual effect, it has to cancel out here. Because if it's making the room seem brighter, it's going to make these patches seem brighter as well, and they would have to, um, those two effects would have to cancel out. But guess what? Again, they don't cancel out. The problem here is not with replicating the effects, the problem is we're getting the effects too often. We're getting the effects when the theories demand their absence. Now this isn't quite fatal yet. Remember that the title of the paper was, Is it Light or Dark? Recalling Moral Behavior Changes Perception of Brightness of Rooms, but Not Patches on Computer. No, that wasn't the title of the paper. Okay. That's exactly the description. <laughs> could there be something special about patches of brightness? On, of course there could, but there's no independent a priori motivation for thinking of that. Okay, so this is an illustration of this kind of approach. This is a new kind of strategy for studying these effects, inspired by an old art historical anecdote. It's relatively widely applicable. It doesn't require us to be clever in order to figure out the alternative explanation. It doesn't rely on null effects, and it is just wonderfully counterintuitive. And literally every week I see a paper <laughs> that is uh, slain by this El Greco fallacy. This is one of my, my recent favorites. The paper came out in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, a short while ago. Political partisanship influences the perception of biracial candidates' skin tone. The idea here is you have to say which one of these is sort of most representative of the person, either for unknown people or for um, uh, known people like Barack Obama. And the idea is that if you are Republican, you, uh, you see Barack, you literally see Barack Obama's skin as being darker, and so you choose the darker <laughs> picture. But again, El Greco, this experiment makes absolutely no sense. It cannot possibly be true, because if the point, I mean, it could be, it could be that if you're Republican, you see African Americans as having darker skin, but then when you're asked, shown pictures of African Americans, that effect would apply as well, and the effect should have to cancel out, and so you shouldn't get the effect. Um, Okay. I also, by the way, find some utterly superficial historical resonance. Uh, I like this work because if you go back to the original Jerome Bruner uh, paper that ignited this whole New Look movement, um, he mentions El Greco in an utterly <coughs> non-substantial way on the very first page of his paper. Um, so we're not going to have time to get through all of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you another example um, um, of a different sort of strategy that's important in this context. Um, can, can everyone just, uh, uh, some of you will have seen these sorts of displays before, can everyone just uh, uh, fixate on that central black disc for a second? And don't move your eyes, keep your eyes fixated right there. And um, this is a putative example of color adaptation. So, so maybe what I'll do, keep your eyes fixated on that black, uh, that little black dot. In a second I'm going to advance to the next image. When I do, there's going to be a black dot in that image too, and I want you to um, uh, uh, still not move your eyes. Keep your eyes right in that black dot. When I go to the next image, uh, just keep staring at the black dot for one second and then close your eyes. Got it? Okay, is everyone ready? We're going to go to the next image. Here we go. Close your eyes. Okay. That second image that I showed you, you can open your eyes again. Um, that second image that I showed you was completely in black and white. Let, let's try this one more time. Um, uh, again, stare at the dot. This, this time you can convince yourself of this. Um, stare at that, stare at that uh, disc and um, stare at that little central black dot. And when I go to the next image, just keep your eyes fixated there for just even half a second or however long you want, and then move your eyes to anywhere else in the image. Ready? So this effect, too, usually has been attributed to the study of visual perception. But in fact, um, we have learned that this effect, too, has nothing to do with seeing the world. It is entirely due to task demands and irresponse bias. Now, when I say that, there's some disagreement. <laughs> so, so what I just said is completely false. That is not true. But the point is you know it's false, right? And you know that this is really perception and is not a response bias and is not a task demand because you could feel it. You could experience it yourself. 
Um, this is what we do in our field. This is what Zenin has been so good at in his career, for example, in his multiple object tracking experiments. The coin of the realm in vision science is the demo. We have statistics, but you don't need any statistics to appreciate um, the path. You want to do it one more time? <laughs> Focus on the red, the, the black disc for a second. Don't move your eyes. Anyone who suggested that that is a response bias is just wrong. You know you have first-hand experience with the fact that it's not a response bias. That's, by the way, why this is what underlies our certainty in so many examples of effects in visual perception, is that we have direct first-hand experience um, with these sort of effects. And it is a awkward, inconvenient, suspicious, telling fact, I think, that in these hundreds and hundreds of putative examples in recent years of top-down effects of cognition on perception, there is exactly one example that I have ever seen of, that I have ever seen, that gives rise to a subjectively appreciable demonstration. Um, and this, I think, is kind of important. You know, when I first read all these recent papers, when I first heard that tool use affects perceived distance, but only when you intended to use it, I was so excited, I went and got a little grabber tool that my daughter has, and I sat at a table, and I put something there, and then I intended to grab it, and then I stopped intending, and then I intended, and I stopped intending, and you know what happened? Nothing. It looked exactly the same. When I first read that more desired objects are seen as closer, I put something I desired and something I didn't desire um, separately at the same time at different distances, and I looked at what happened, and you know what happened? Nothing at all. When I learned that first, I'm not kidding here, when I read this paper um, from Mark Changizi, who's a brilliant vision guy, um, when I read that thirst will make surfaces seem more transparent, I literally stopped drinking water for that day and started eating pretzels to get really thirsty. And then I looked at the putatively ambiguous surfaces, and guess what happened? Nothing at all. Um, none of these things are subjectively appreciable, which I think is a big problem. But I think there's one exception. And our goal in this literature has always been to address not the low-hanging fruit, as it were, but the most compelling, most exciting examples of this research. So um, a vision scientist, a great collaboration actually between a vision scientist, Dan Levin, and a social psychologist, Mazar and Banaji, had this paper a while back, Distortions in the Perceived Lightness of Faces, the Role of Race Categories. And they used these sorts of stimuli. These are stimuli that you can readily appreciate are uh, examples of Caucasian faces and African American faces, which I will now just call white and black faces. Um, but they've been constructed in a particular way so that there isn't actually a mean luminance difference between them. Um, this face has exactly the same mean luminance as this face. Um, and this was to, this, these were created by Dan Levin to study the role of um, the perception of race on the basis of differences in facial structure, unconfounded by differences in actual lightness. Um, but the amazing thing about these stimuli that I think actually works as a demo here is that when you look at this, this face is not any darker than this face, but it looks darker, right? You can actually subjectively appreciate that that face looks darker. And so there were a number of experiments designed to show this, but I think this actually really works as a demo. This is a putative effect of race and racial categorization on the perception of a very basic visual feature of lightness. So this seemed very exciting. Um, this effect works very well. We, again, were able to replicate it, no problem. Um, of course, these are not the same images. And so we don't know at the beginning whether this is due to something interesting in high level, some aspect of cognition, racial categorization here, or whether it's due to some, uh, some something about the low level image features. Of course, there have to be differences in the low level images, otherwise they'd be the same face. But for example, if you scramble horizontally the pixels in these images, you can see that the distribution of light and dark is very different among those images. Um, what we decided to do to look at this, rather than do the hard work of trying to study all the particular subtle differences in luminance distribution, we have basically two competing explanations. You always have two competing explanations in this sort of context. You have the higher level effect and you have the putative lower level effect. So rather than trying to study the lower level effect, um, we thought we could study this simply by getting rid of the higher level effect. And the logic of this is going to be, if we just eliminate race, but we still get the same effect, then it's kind of like the El Greco fallacy, only insofar as we're getting the effect when the theory demands that we shouldn't, if it's really due to racial categorization. So we simply took those initial images, and we blurred them. 
And this is what you get. And um, again, these have the same luminance, same mean luminance, they have the same contrast profiles. Um, and at least for me, I think the demo still works here. I still think the image on the left looks darker than the image on the right, even though that is not true um, in terms of the mean luminance. We tried to do this maximally carefully in our actual experiments. Um, we asked people which one is blurrier, larger, darker, more interesting. We tried to bury the question of interest in a long list of things. Um, we assessed race as carefully as it was possible to assess race here. We had them describe the images. Um, we had them describe the blurry faces to help someone else pick them out of a lineup later on. Um, while they were visible, we asked them whether they thought they were the same race, the same age, the same gender, the same facial expression, etc. We asked them directly at the end of the experiment did they guess that this was about race. Over 100 online subjects, only 3% volunteered that they perceived any racial difference in these blurred images. Um, and actually, all three of those people mentioned explicitly that it was the same race. They said, for example, they were of a white man in his 30s, they were very blurry. Only 12% mentioned race when they were actually looking at the faces. Um, again, most of those uh, suggested that they were of the same race. They said, for example, it was a young female Caucasian with a strong jawline, or good luck, I couldn't make out enough detail to tell anything. <laughs> And even in explicit judgments, 83% of the subjects explicitly said that they were this, those two blurred faces had the same race. That was actually more similarity than for age, gender, expression. And then we simply asked them afterwards which one of them is darker, and we got exactly the same effect that Levin and Banaji did, critically looking only at that subset of subjects who perceived no difference in race whatsoever. In fact, they didn't even mention or see any difference in race. Um, this is mTurk, so we can be very, very certain of these results. We run hundreds of subjects, and then you know what? We just do it again, and you get exactly the same effect. It's quite a, quite a robust finding. Um, we then went on to address race in many other ways. We had them explicitly select the race uh, for each face, as we did gender, age, expression, really trying to give them every opportunity to tell us that they perceived any difference in race between those blurry faces. And basically, you get exactly the same pattern of results. And then you get exactly the same pattern of results again. So here's an example where I think there is a real interesting demo here. But I don't think it has anything to do with race. It has nothing to do with racial categorization. And I think our field, this, this paper has been held up as sort of the hallmark, I think rightly so, because of its demo of these sorts of effects. Um, but I think that we have been misled by only trying to explore cases where we get effects when our theory suggests that we should get them. And we have not done as good a job as making sure that the effects go away in these situations when the theory suggests that they should. Um, OK, I, I can do this one very quickly. Um, here's, here's a third example of the, uh, of the importance of, of many of Zenin's ideas, I think, in exploring the possibility of top-down effects of cognition on perception. And this one has to do with drawing distinctions, something that Zenin was very good at throughout his entire career. And the distinction that we're going to focus on here is that between perception and memory. So, Something gets muddled together in all of these discussions, um, and that's the distinction between perception and recognition, between seeing and seeing as. Um, some of the examples that I've talked about so far are very clearly about perception. For example, just the perception of how light a uh, grayscale patch is on a computer screen. But so many of the experiments in this field are not about um, seeing, but they're about uh, recognizing what you see. Um, they're about seeing as. And seeing as, or recognition, always intrinsically must involve both sort of front-end visual processing, making some match with back-end existing memory. And it becomes very important in these circumstances, if you're interested in the possibility that cognition affects perception, to distinguish between these two. Um, for example, just take like the phenomenon of semantic priming from cognitive psychology. There's an effect where you're faster to recognize something, but no one would attribute that to changes in visual processing. We understand that these are just changes in thresholds of um, uh, representations in, in some cases, long-term associative memory, um, changes that happen before any visual stimulus is ever presented. 
So to illustrate the importance of this distinction in practice, I'll tell you about one more quick example. Um, this was a very exciting paper. Like so much of social psychology, it was published in Cognition, and then five minutes later was published in an enormous thing in the New York Times, which made a big deal of this. The moral pop-up effect against perceptual awareness of morally relevant stimuli. This experiment could not have been simpler. You simply showed subjects words. In some cases, they were words. In some cases, they were non-words. Uh, a bunch of like patterns appeared right afterwards, and you simply had to say that very quickly flashed thing, was it a word or was it not a word? And the result is that a critical threshold of perceptual awareness here, and a critical uh, threshold where you weren't that good at this, you were better at identifying that it was a word if it was moral. And the idea is that morality is so intrinsic to our mental lives that it even will bring something into awareness faster in terms of what we see because of its moral content. And sure enough, this works very well. This is our replication of this fact. We got exactly the same magnitude. There's about a 5% difference when you present the words very quickly um, uh, between categorizing moral words versus categorizing non-moral words. Um, the authors of this paper conclude that moral concerns shape our basic awareness. Um, and they were only thinking about this from the context of perception. If you start to think about the distinction between <coughs> perception and memory, I think you start to, to see that something else may be going on. Here, for example, are the words that they use. For their moral words, they use all sorts of words that are clearly related to morality. And they very carefully um, matched these words for word frequency, for word length, etc. Uh, many different factors by using words that were not moral. And if you're thinking about this in the context of perception, I think that all seems fine. But if you're thinking about it in the context of a possible contribution of memory, I don't think anyone is arguing that cognition does not affect memory. There's a huge problem here. And do you see what the problem is? It is true that these words are all related to morality, but they are also all related to each other. Whereas these are just a bunch of random words. And so, um, they called their paper the moral pop-out effect enhanced perceptual awareness of morally relevant stimuli. We called our paper enhanced visual awareness for morality in pajamas. <laughs> Perception versus memory in top-down effects. We simply replicated the study, but instead of moral words, we used fashion words. Words that were all related to each other, but that we really thought no one would be brave enough to suggest that fashion is so important to our mental lives. Um, um, what we really think is going on here, of course, is that this is just semantic priming. These words just all primed each other. Morality has absolutely nothing to do with it. Perception has absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, and sure enough, when you run this study, and again, we're carefully controlled for word length and word frequency, I find this surprisingly engaging to note that, like, Underwear and offspring, bikini and sludge have exactly the same word frequency. <laughs> um, same exact task, same exact effect. <coughs> we ran it again, we used transportation words. Um, all words related to transportation, matched words over here, skateboard, turtleneck, same length, same word frequency. Um, so um, not only is there an effect of these other things, but if anything, these other effects dwarf the effect of morality. Um, I think that this is really just semantic priming going on here. I think this has nothing to do with uh, perception, which is the point here. Oh, by the way, you can show it's semantic priming if you look even more closely. The words and non-words were all just presented randomly, but you can look at those occasions where it just so happens that uh, two of, in this case, the fashion words occur uh, one after the other, or two unrelated words occur one after the other. Um, versus the opposite. In this case, you get priming. In this case, you don't get any priming. Moral words don't pop out. Pa fashion words don't pop out, except when they are sufficiently primed in that context. So the distinction between perception and memory, when considered at a remove, very abstractly, seems very confusing. Of course, memory is involved in many kinds of perception. Many of us study visual working memory in our laboratories. But all of those sorts of concerns vanish in the daylight of an actual experiment like this. The point of this is to show how the distinction between perception and memory can be turned into an empirical question in this context. Um, and here's an example where I think it really matters. Um, thousands of New York Times readers are under the mistaken impression that morality changes how they see, when it really 
Morality affects perception. It has nothing to do with morality or perception. The only part of that that is the true claim is the word affects. <laughs> and again, this same insight can explain so many other experiments. Um, hunger modifies conscious access for food-related stimuli. Well, yes, I believe that that happens, but not because of anything related to perception, because when you're hungry, what are you thinking about? <laughs> food. You're priming food in your mind. Um, language boosts otherwise unseen objects into awareness, etc. So I think to show that Zenin was wrong, to show that cognition really does influence perception, it would take more than the kinds of experiments that have been littering our literature recently, um, especially from these other domains <coughs> of social psychology. We would need not only to solve the problems of task demands and attention and the like, but we would need a less confirmatory research strategy. We would need to pursue the possibility of real cool demos in this field, like in every other area of perception. And we would need to draw careful distinctions between perception and processes of memory, for example, semantic priming. And I'll just mention, this is part of a larger project uh, that uh, my graduate student and I have. I actually think there are six separate pitfalls, and we've looked at just a couple of them uh, this morning. And I think collectively, the claim that we want to make is that these six pitfalls collectively undermine every single one of the hundreds of experiments in this domain over the last couple of years. And very much following Zenon's lead, um, this is forthcoming now in a behavioral and brain sciences target article. Uh, and also following Zenon's lead, we aimed for a very modest, humble title, Cognition does not affect perception. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you see how this is an example not only of these ideas in principle, but how these things can be turned into empirical questions, how we can study these things in practice. Um, so I think whereas seeing does traffic in all sorts of interesting high-level things insofar as it embodies, um, uh, it traffics in representations of things like causality and animacy and intention and the like, um, it is not the case that the arrow goes in the other direction. It is not the case that thinking influences seeing, uh, as Zenin suggested so long ago. All of these experiments and their associated demos are on our webpage. Um, and uh, I hope that it is obvious to you, knowing about Zenin, that this work owes everything to Zenin's influence and to Zenin's training, not only in terms of how to be an experimenter, how to create new sorts of paradigms, um, but his influence in asking uh, this kind of question in the first place. And so thank you so much. So my role in the rest of the meeting is to keep us on time, which is now bitterly hypocritical and ironic. Um, um, I'll take just one or two questions, and then we're going to break for a very short coffee break. Rochelle. I think about ambiguous figures. That is not a question. I believe, I believe that is true. <laughs> Um, is there, right, so if you take the case, is it, are they the example as nicer you use them yep. to force you to say, uh oh, I got it wrong? So ambiguous figures seem like an amazing case where putatively your intentions, for example, are changing what you see. The light entering your eyes remains constant, but for, at least for some of us, you can look at, say, a duck rabbit and say, now I see a duck, now I see a rabbit. Um, I am convinced here by Zenin's own arguments, and I think there's actually very good data to back this up, that when you say that you are seeing those different sorts of things, you really are, of course, but the mechanism of implementing your intention is to change your attention to the images. So people have shown pretty convincingly, I think, for example, that um, when you look at ambiguous figures and you decide to switch from one interpretation to the other, probe detection goes up on certain regions of the image, which if you well, attend more to it, yeah. no, no, One more question. I, I like that the experiments with the African-American faces, and I'm wondering, when they comparing the luminosity, it, those were an average, but the, the darkness is not distributed evenly on, on the image. And I'm wondering about the, why do we get these such differences in the perception of darkness? Why do we get differences in the perception of darkness? So. Um, I need to be careful with this. I have an answer to this, but we have not done all the careful research in this context of these actual faces to show this is true. So this is a speculative answer. And again, I think the power of the experiments I did show you is we can show that it's not about race without having to sort of get our hands all dirty with this.
But I think basically when you characterize what the nature of the difference is between that African American face and the Caucasian face that are equated for mean luminance, there is a massive difference in the concentration of luminance, basically in the density yeah. profile. Yeah. Not just spatially over the image, but just how basically how clustered the dark pixels and the light pixels are overall. When you look at the details of how they made those images in order to make the uh, in order to make the white face, for example, appear just as dark as the dark face, uh, sorry, in order to have it be the same actual objective um, luminance on average, they had to make the eyes mm -hmm. seem extremely dark. They're like very black, dark eyes, whereas the African American has much, much lighter eyes. And it turns out that the mind does not treat every part of a face equally in this context. Eyes are treated as very, very special and get very different kinds of processing. And so it's kind of cheating, I think, in that way to like do it by focusing darker light pixels in the eye regions where they're not going to be uh, processed in the same way. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. But again, that's uh, we we haven't done the we have very intentionally not done the hard work to show that that is. <laughs> um, let's break for a five-minute coffee break before our next talk.